Hello and welcome to the i3 Insights podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. As you probably know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. The following recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to another edition of the i3 Insights podcast. Today, we're privileged to have a distinguished guest, Bob Maynard. He is the Chief Investment Officer of the Public Employment Retirement System of Idaho, or PERSI. He's written extensively about investment matters. He has some very interesting ideas, which we're looking forward to discussing. Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I thought we'd start off, Bob, with a little bit about you and how you come to work at Percy and the kind of things that you do there. So perhaps you could take us through your your journey in the funds management industry. <laughs> well, my journey started back in the uh, 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 1970s, 1980s. Uh, I started out uh, being an assistant attorney general for the state of Alaska in 1975, and I had many responsibilities up there. Eventually, uh, back up there, Alaska was uh, just starting out as a state, and when we hit oil, all this money rolled in, and so I did a lot of things. I was bond counsel. I was um, uh, I ran all the oil and gas matters uh, for a while, um, uh, things of that nature. And during that period of time, uh, the state decided to save its oil money. And we set up, and I had a hand in setting it up, uh, one of the first sovereign wealth funds in the world, the Alaska Permanent Fund. At that time, there was one in Kuwait. Uh, there was one in Nauru, an island near you all. Uh, and we were about the first three or four uh, sovereign wealth funds in the world. Uh, and initially, the state put it all in bonds, but this was in the 70s, and all of a sudden inflation became a concern, and they broadened out the uh, investment uh, sides. And I, because I was doing a lot of stuff, I was sent over to help set up their investment program. Uh, uh, I had been buying and selling oil, we've been constructing refineries, pipelines, things of that nature. And so I was helped to go over to set up when they were investing internationally and in real estate and in similar sorts of things. Uh, And about the mid-80s, a lot of my lawsuits were um, long and complicated, and I I had been an attorney for too long. I was offered the job of being Deputy Executive Director of the Alaska Permanent Fund, uh, and I went over and did that. I went back to do some um, uh, helping out the state on some of the oil crises like the Exxon Valdez, but for the most part, dedicated full-time to Alaska, uh, uh, investing uh, in Alaska since the uh, early to mid-80s. And then in 1992, uh, uh, we decided to move south uh, where uh, roads connected again and uh, we could see warm summer nights. So I came to Boise uh, to uh, be the chief investment officer for the Idaho retirement system. It's interesting to to hear you say that you started out as a lawyer. I know a few uh, chief investment officers that were once upon a time lawyers or come from a legal background. How do you think Mm -hmm. that influences your investment approach? Uh, Well, it helps a lot. One is you you recognize a a lot of being a chief investment officer is not necessarily investments, but explaining being a chief investment interpretive officer maybe, uh, where you basically are trying to uh, make sure that what you're doing can be explained and implemented through um, other people, through other people, both above you in terms of the boards and your constituency, and through the people that you uh, are using. So there's a lot of skills in uh, uh, legal analysis and careful thinking, in explaining what you're trying to do, and making sure it's consistent with uh, other parts of the operation that have been of great assistance. Also, I was uh, fortunate um, 
uh, in my legal background that a lot of the, the uh, cases that I had up in Alaska, uh, particularly uh, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Rate case, that were novel ideas of how uh, that we were using a lot of then-developing capital market theory uh, in the uh, prosecution or the explanation of the case in front of the various agencies and courts. So we would have people like, for example, Ken Arrow was one of our um, um, uh, witnesses back then uh, to explain how you should set rates. So a lot of capital market theory went into a lot of the uh, types of projects and cases uh, I was working on when I was in Alaska. How, how would you describe your investment philosophy, and your, your approach? There are a thousand ways uh, uh, that are appropriate for investing and putting a portfolio together. The key is picking the one that is as simple as is needed to try to meet your particular liabilities and that uh, you got to be careful not to outrun your supply lines. In other words, don't do something so complicated that you can't figure out what's going on if something goes wrong. I, I think that's, that's good advice and it kind of implies less focus on peers and more focus on objectives. I think that's right. implicit in your statement. But how should how should funds go about thinking about what's right for them? Well, you really need to decide what your liabilities really are and what time frame you have uh, to practically meet those liabilities. Uh, and if you and pretty much, I think if you talk to every chief investment officer, you won't find much disagreement among us uh, about the basics of what you're trying to do. The, the the primary reason for differences in investment approaches from the very simple, uh, where we're on the simple side, to the very complex uh, depends a lot on what's the nature of liability and what resources do you have to draw on them. Um, so I think that that's trying to figure out where you are on the and how much uh, uh, do you have to explain to your constituency when times go wrong what's going on and why it's going on. And that primarily sets your the, the parameters of your portfolio. Uh, and, it's, and it's not all that clear, by the way, that more complex approaches uh, necessarily give you better results. In fact, there's a, still a huge debate about that. And you can, and so you, depending on where you stand on that debate, uh, also can influence how you pick your portfolio. Just on that point about complexity, why do you think there is such a pull towards the complex and the novel in our industry? <laughs> well, there's behavioral things that I think have a lot to do with it. I mean, if you're uh, um, uh, if you're on my side of the industry, uh, the more complex uh, your portfolio, the better opportunities there are to move on to higher and higher paying jobs. If you're a consultant, uh, you don't. Um, it, it, it's very difficult to say uh, take two asset types and call me in ten years. Um, <laughs> That doesn't really get you there. If you are a manager, the more you have to have something to sell. And if you're on the side of, uh, and if you look at a lot of the, uh, um, uh, on your side of the business, uh, if, if you followed our way of investing and you were CNBC, all you'd be seeing on the screen is a blue screen and the sound of crickets <laughs> because there's not much to talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you know about the Widow Buffett portfolio? The 90-10 Vanguard that was the, portfolio. That's the 90-10. Yes. In that, in, in, when he, read that letter again, because he made another Buffett bet on that one, similar to his hedge fund bet. He made the express statement that that, because remember, first of all, this is for his widow. I mean, this is not something that has a 30 or 40 year time horizon. Secondly, he made the statement that this will outperform the majority or almost all of the individual and institutional portfolios over time. And it's certainly been true since 2013. So there's and if you and if you read David Swenson, by the way, who the uh, the, the godfather of the endowment model, his book uh, in the uh, 2005 
uh, unconventional investing basically makes the same claim. Uh, a simple portfolio uh, will beat 95% of the institutional portfolios. It's only the investing 1% that can do it. So there's a big debate as to whether or not going on the more complex side uh, really uh, gives you the benefits. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence out there uh, that it doesn't. It's uh, it's interesting you mentioned the Buffett widow paper. I've I've seen a great paper. I think it's called Buffett with a twist, and it takes mm -hmm. that idea and the twist that it puts on it is that the the income that the widow needs to survive each year, instead of drawing that down pro rata, they draw that down off the asset class that is doing better. So they they rebalance. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And that's how we actually rebalance, too. We have a net payment out. We use it to get back uh, to the standard. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the interesting thing about the Widow Buffett portfolio and similar sorts of uh, simpler approaches is if you also think about it, given the that also sets out your uh, how deep is your supply line. Because how much reporting do you need to do? How many people do you need to hire? How many consultants do you need to track a ni that, that 90 10 portfolio? Uh, basically, all you got to do is wake up once a month and look at the headlines. Actually, once a year. You can spend all your time at your Sydney beaches uh, when the weather's hot. <laughs> So, I mean, so, so behaviorally, in terms of the fees you have to pay, in terms of the complexity you have to follow, uh, you can fit your particular needs alongside that. By the way, I, I, I should mention that I, I have been on boards where we have put in very simple 55% uh, U.S. equities, 15% uh, IFA, 30% uh, aggregate. That's my, that's our, uh, my general Widow Buffett type portfolio starting point. And it's very difficult to keep a board on that simple approach, passive approach over time, because you're going to get people in as boards change. There'll always be someone who wants to do something more complex. And the problem with that sort of behavioral idea, it's like I call it rental car return investing. Once your front wheel go over those spikes, it's extremely difficult or impossible to back up. So... <laughs> There's a there's that kind of driving feature. You start adding people. No one comes to you and says, "I'm I I I have to I don't have enough work to do. Give me less." Um, it always kind of the work and the complexity expands uh, to uh, uh, overrun the number of people you've already hired. Your comments lead into my next question, which is this idea of conventional investing that you've written right. about in the past. Can you give mm -hmm. our listeners a brief description of what you mean by that term? Basically, conventional investing is is take is your, is your standard capital market investing. What you learned in uh, eight thirty uh, econ uh, in college. It's 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 uh, uh, primarily it it looks it, it it looks at the major asset classes as traditionally defined equities fixed income uh maybe real estate uh maybe private equity but it it, it focuses primarily on simp simplicity transparency focus and patient you're relying tr primarily on market returns uh from the traditional asset classes uh it basically you set it up by taking five steps, there's five major questions uh, that you um, that you ask yourself. First, given your liabilities, what is your equity fixed income mix? Uh, and generally, you uh, are thinking that equities are going to give you going to give you five percent to seven percent returns above inflation over twenty or thirty year periods, and um, uh, fixed income is going to give you maybe one to two percent above inflation over those periods. And you look at your liabilities and you say, what real return am I looking for? And if your real return is somewhere in that 3% to 5% range, then generally uh, you'll, you'll have a 60% to 70% equity, 30 to 40% fixed income basic split. Now, by the way, 
if your real return needs are above 5% and, uh, and some endowments are in that 6 7 or 8% uh, uh, range, or your time frame is such that you've got to do, you, you have to worry about your cash flows over something less than five years, uh, three years or under. Conventional investing is not appropriate. Uh, it's appropriate for a certain type of range of liabilities. So the first question is, what is your equity fixed? And if a 60 to 70 percent equity, 30 to 40 percent fixed income split generally gets you that 3 to 5 percent returns over time with pretty good consistency, then you're a candidate for conventional investing. So that's your first question, equity fixed split. Second question is, how much of a home country bias do you want? or do you need? Because if you're in a smaller market, you need more of, you need less of a home country bias. If you're in the U.S., the home country bias can be fairly high. Uh, for example, the Widow Buffett portfolio, that 90-10, that was a 90% equity, 10% for the type of liabilities he was looking at, and he had 100% home country bias. Ours, uh, for Percy, we need uh, just less than 4% real returns, so a 70-30 equity fixed income mix works perfectly fine. So once you decide those first two questions, then the second next question is how much do you want to diversify out into the major asset types uh, to give you some diversification? And, the ma and here we're talking U.S. large cap, U.S. small cap, uh, international developed, emerging markets, investment grade fixed income, tips for inflation protected securities, and cash, and real estate. Uh, real estate is thrown in there too. Those are your basic diversification vehicles. Uh, Buffett didn't go into them because uh, he didn't think those were needed, but for traditional conventional investing, those are the first nine to ten things you do. After that, the question is, and, and by the way, at that point, the benefits of diversification fall off dramatically because in order to have an asset type that makes a difference, you need to have at least 5% in. Having 1% or 2% of something in doesn't move the needle on an overall portfolio basis. So basically, once you get to that first 9 to 10 asset types, those can be relatively simply implemented, cheaply implemented, and you don't need that many people to follow it. Uh, then the question is, what is your rebalancing discipline? Uh, how much are you going to let yourself drift away from that? And there's controversy about that, by the way. But those are your first four major uh, uh, decisions in conventional investing. And those are the ones that make up 95 to 100 percent of your returns. The question after that, then, is how much passive and how much active. And if you do active, what types of active do you want to do? But that's usually the fifth and least important of all the questions in conventional investing. It's funny that you mentioned active uh, versus passive as being the least important decision because it always seems to be the one where the most money is spent. If, if you think about it, the, 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 yeah. fee, the fees that consultants and other people charge to help you with your asset allocation, which is really the first four questions combined, um, mm -hmm. much less than the money that's spent on that last question that uh, that adds probably the least value. And, and the amount of time spent and the amount of work done in most investment portfolios. If you go to board meetings, a lot of time usually is spent on go, a consultant going over how the active managers are doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's and over, for example, for Percy, uh, over time, Active management has paid off, but it's only in that five basis to ten basis point a year range. The rebalancing question is worth four times that amount on a yearly basis. Uh, and the, everything else is determined by the asset allocation. So, I mean, it, it, it's, if, if active management works, it's still only going to be less than, 90, uh, less than half a percent of your returns. So, just listening to you go through your description of conventional investing. I'm anticipating the questions that some of our listeners may have. They may be thinking, but compared to, say, the endowment model, what you're describing seems to uh, give up the opportunity to make money from the illiquidity premium in, say, in unlisted property or infrastructure or private equity. 
uh, doesn't sound like you're as deeply focused on on specialists or niche asset classes like Timberland mm -hmm. or um, buying the royalties to a recording artist's back catalog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. C c catastrophe bonds, uh, exactly. uh, all the other similar sorts of things. Yeah, no, uh, I'm not. A, it's I'm not opposed to putting in that. We have private equity uh, and we have private real estate too. Uh, but it's it's around that 10 to 14%. I mean, private equity is around uh, 8% as our base position. We're down to six right now. Uh, uh, private and public real estate is also around seven and a half, eight percent 8%. It's a little, it's, a, it's around that right now. Those are fine to add, but it really depends upon your resources to be able to easily track them. Conventional investing depends on the main asset types and recognizes that your equity, public equity volatility is your major issue. Uh, endowment investing tries to be a salmon swimming upstream in those environments. And it turned out to be a disaster in 2008. The things they ran into uh, turned out to be even more dangerous uh, than uh, the public equity market, for that matter. Uh, so th there were issues on that. And in terms of risk, we, we're obviously seeing a greater uh, popularity of risk-based approaches, whether that be risk parity yeah. or risk budgeting or looking at investments. Risk, risk factors. Exactly. Um, yes. A any views on those risk-based approaches? They're illusory. Uh, the, the, the question is, there's no unit of risk that is consistent over time. Uh, the, the, uh, one, of the, one of the best works, I, I think there are two uh, seminal works, three seminal works in investing. One is the history of interest rates. Uh, the second, uh, of course, is are all the basic uh, capital market, a textbook, sharp, uh, uh, all that. But the third is in the mid-90s, uh, Mandelbrot put together fractals and scaling patterns in finance. It was popularly rewritten right after the, the turn of the millennium as a misbehavior of markets. And it's very clear when you look at the capital markets on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, it's not that uh, uh, bell-shaped, uh, efficient market, uh, mean variance curve. It's earthquake land. And it's uh, the, the world uh, and anything under five to six years, the uh, linear, um, blogarithmic, uh, uh, smooth, um, normal randomness doesn't apply. Uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly, and sometimes yearly basis, basically you're like in, in an earthquake. It's wild randomness. You'll have long periods of calm, uh, uh, the Joseph effect it's called. Uh, then you'll have wild periods of volatility much higher than one would, respect, one, one would expect, and that's called the NOAA uh, effect. And the problem is, is and this is also uh, described as fat tails and high peaks. And the math for those doesn't tell you what to do. It just tells you when you're in an earthquake. And so as a result, if you look at the uh, characteristics, uh, there's no unit of risk. The uh, standard deviation, the fat tails and high peaks, don't start to disappear until you get rolling five to seven year periods. Uh, anything less than that, you, you don't have a unit of risk. You don't have a st standard deviation doesn't mean anything. The standard deviation of moves over a one day period how many times have you heard people say there's a nine standard deviation event or it was a seven standard deviation event? In any other area, just a simple one-time occurrence of that tells you don't use those mathematics. And the problem with all the risk mathematics is that they're using mathematics that have been demonstrated to be inappropriate on any reasonable period of time. And so you don't have a unit of risk. You, when, you, when someone says that we're, we, uh, we're measuring to a certain uh, standard deviation or a sharp ratio, uh, you've got to ask them, over what time period are you collecting your data? Because if you do it on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis or a yearly basis, you're using fundamentally different units of measurement. And so as a result, um, uh, there's no risk to budget.
You can't budget something that doesn't have a standard measuring unit. You raise points about the fact that uh, a standard de deviation can mean different things over different periods and even different asset classes, I guess. Um, well, yeah, but and also too, but over different time periods. It's not stable over time. Sure. Uh, are there any other approaches that you found um, helpful rather than uh, a pure risk-based uh, statistical approach? Well, every once in a while, it hasn't happened this millennium, but you, you'll see the ability to enter a new asset class. Uh, the last one, uh, REITs uh, opened up in the uh, mid-1990s. Uh, then you had TIPS coming in in the late 1990s. Those sorts of new uh, liquid and transparent asset types um, uh, rarely come along. Those are, those are very helpful when they show up. Otherwise, no. Uh, the, the relatively straightforward approaches uh, survived the late 90s, uh, the tech wreck, uh, the first worst market since the Great Depression, and did quite nicely in the 2007-2009 period. Uh, lost less than many uh, other more complicated approaches. Uh, there's a lot of new things out there now, and you describe some of them. Uh, you have crisis risk offset, for example, uh, as, a, as an, an asset approach, and people are really trying to carve up the traditional asset types into new risk factors. But to, to me, it's just cutting up the pie in different slices. None of the, all of them right now are being advanced as a matter of faith in the future, there's nothing that's being advanced now that has withstood the test of time. And while I am glad everybody's doing all, all these different things, until we go through the next crisis, you won't tell whether or not anything stuck. Uh, because everything that was advanced as the new wave prior to, for example, 2007 to 2009, for example, hedge funds, portable alpha, uh, there was a bunch of other things, blew up spectacularly. And I'll be interested to see whether or not the new approaches that people are taking uh, in terms of restructuring portfolios and redescribing portfolios uh, survive the next crisis. And if something does, perfectly willing to pick it up. Uh, but the, uh, the relatively simple approach, uh, the conventional approach, work, has worked pretty well for the last 40 years if your liabilities fit within that framework of that 3 to 5% real return. Um, if you can't handle, if, if our, our funded status as of this morning is 93% uh, by U.S. actuarial standards. Uh, and if we were on other standards, we'd be over 100% funded. Um, so we can handle a downturn. If we were down like uh, some are, down in the 50% uh, uh, funded ratio, or we were in a situation where we couldn't handle near-term volatility, uh, or we needed to make above that 6 to 7% real return, uh, then the only alternatives are uh, these newer, fancier approaches. But it hasn't been demonstrated yet. It's not on a matter of faith. Uh, whether or not it's better than going to Vegas and putting it all on red has still to be demonstrated. So you mentioned earlier uh, active management plays a role in your portfolio at Percy. Right. How do you think about where and when active management is more or less likely to add value after costs? Do you have a framework for assessing that? Well, we look at it every year, every five years, or every 10 years. Uh, we don't depend on active management for success. Uh, I just don't want them to hurt me. <laughs> if you have cl uh, clear investment styles that are easy to track or um, portfolios, then you've got to stick with them over five to 10 year periods. They can be out of favor. Value investing, for example. It was out of favor for most of the 90s roared back, and it's been out of favor now, or quality value, it's been out of favor for the last four to five or six years. So you can't 
it, it, depending upon your philosophy of picking managers, and we pick managers, these are clear styles that are easily understood, or they have um, uh, uh, smaller portfolios. So you can track at the end of the day, we know within 10 basis points of what a manager should have made given the market at the end of the day. We can look at their portfolio and know instantly why they were doing differently than we may think. Um, uh, that's why we like at, well, where we have active managers. Active managers are there for informational value because for us, if an active manager who's a deep value manager isn't keeping up with the market, that tells us something about the market. It doesn't tell us uh, we have faith. It's easy to tell whether our manager is on track or off track uh, for what we hire them. Uh, and it's that informational value uh, that I find active management uh, useful for, not the idea they're going to add meaningfully to my portfolio over time. Okay, that's a that's an interesting perspective. In terms of of fees and uh, and what you pay for active management, are you open to using performance fees, or how do you structure that side mm. of your portfolio? No, I I'm opposed until they pay me when they lose money <laughs> it's an asymmetric payoff and all i'm doing it's it, it, it the only performance fees seem to me simply the implementation of the idea that misery loves company if i'm suffering i want you to suffer too but are they going to be working harder are they going to be picking different stocks are they going to uh uh, uh get an extra piece of intelligence uh because of a performance fee no. And so as a result, what ends up happening, and since it's not asymmetric, you only end up paying the winners because you get rid of the losers fast. And uh, uh, because you, uh, this is the same problem with private equity, uh, uh, you end up paying more uh, because you end up uh, uh, only paying the, the and, it's still, and you still can't tell over a three to five year period whether their outperformance is luck. Uh, because they happen to be in the high peak of one of those uh, uh, high peak period of times, um, it, 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 it makes no sense to me, okay. or little sense. That's, that's, that's an interesting point you make about if you consistently sack your underperforming managers and you have them on performance fees, then you're, you're left with all the managers that you have to pay a fee to. So that's a... Uh, and that's right. And, and the, the period of time where their outperformance is because of demonstrated skill, you won't have them long enough because it's going to take you seven years of data to figure it out. Because remember, the nature of the... Uh, people always, uh, on this earthquake thing where, where you have high peaks and fat tails, people always say you've got to watch out for the fat tails. But it's equally dangerous in a high peak state where you have those incremental, smaller returns that are happening more often than normal randomness uh, would, um, would say. Uh, if there's a strategy, sharp ratios love those high peak strategies. And what happens is people run to those, and we're in one of those right now, by the way, uh, where you're getting incremental small returns that are more often than normal randomness would say, that uh, uh, coin tossing randomness would say, well, this is more often than chance was, what, what occurred. Well, when you're in a high peak of uh, a period, that's just as dangerous because you think you have skill when you just happen to be uh, trading in the temper of the times. And that's the problem with performance fees. They are very difficult to construct where you are really trying to separate luck from skill in an earthquake environment. So changing things up slightly, in sourcing of active management, is that a good idea or a bad idea for funds to uh, try and create their own investment teams and do it themselves rather than pick managers? This, this, this is the question of how, how, how good is your supply line? Um, yeah. It is extremely difficult when you insource to maintain the resources necessary to keep that going, to pay the people. Heck, even Harvard couldn't do it. So that's the danger. I mean, and, uh, the danger is, you, if, in theory, 
uh, you can bring in people and do as adequate a job as an outside active manager. I don't think necessarily that's the case. But two things happen. One is you better be in an environment where you can keep and maintain those resources. Secondly, the overall organization, the board itself, now is wearing two hats rather than one. And sometimes that gets very confusing. Uh, one is you are a, a board like my board where you're picking managers and picking approaches, picking strategies. But secondly, you are now also the board of one of the managers you've picked. And that's a completely different skill set. And not only is it a completely different skill set, it is also something you can sometimes confuse one with the other. In other words, you, your decision as to whether to go into an asset type um, is uh, uh, confused by the fact is can we do it internally? That sometimes happens. Third, it's extremely difficult to file to fi fire yourself. In fact, Harvard is one of the few examples I've seen where they actually went that route and is are now trying to reduce staff. Uh, usually, that staff keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. It's like the rental car return investing. Once you add an area and you add staff, rarely will you have the occasion to sit there and say, I don't need that staff anymore. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's always... Um surprised me about it is that the is the asset classes that people choose to start with um you know you'd think they'd start with the least risky and work their way up maybe run a cash portfolio yeah. or some short-term fixed income first and then but everybody seems to uh start with equities and real assets um yeah. well not only that it's not all see everybody all you hear is anecdotal uh, you only hear about the people who are coming back from Vegas who won the won in the slots. Uh, this idea that that, that these in house models are uniformly successful is not true. Uh, if, uh, Canadians alone, for every Ontario, there's been a casse de po from in the '90s when they blew up and almost took down their their thing. Uh, 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 the the returns overall of those that have gone in house with large staffs are not that much better and mostly particularly after 2007 2008 were much worse than uh more simpler organizations like i say you only hear about the winners and people only brag about their successes uh it's when you look at the numbers uh it's uh much more problematic that doesn't mean that there aren't some people that are extremely successful at it, that it can't be done. Uh, the, 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 one of the things, do you know the best performing institutional billion dollar plus fund in the world over the last 40 years? 40 years? And by the way, Yale wasn't Yale for the mid-90s. No, you'll have to South tell Dakota. me who it is. South Dakota. South Dakota. Uh, Steve Myers and Matt Clark. They have an in-house group of, uh, they've, they, they've, they put in place in the 70s a small cap value oriented. Uh, they pick the stocks themselves, have a very, very, very uh, straightforward model they've kept with. They only hire people from uh, South Dakota universities who like the lifestyle and will stay there. And um, they have beaten the daylights out of everybody else over 40 years. And they, and, but what they've been able to demonstrate is they've been able to keep to that style through thick and thin. They were able to keep through it in the late 90s when everybody was, was screaming about the death of value investing. Uh, they've been able to keep with it lately, and they, by far, they're the, uh, uh, the best. You know the worst performer in the, in the 2000s? Norway. By the way, the best performer going on right now, another very successful shop, is uh, New Zealand. Uh, Adrian Orr and whoever went before him, I think it was Paul Costello, put together something. I, I, uh, their returns are magic. I, I'm st I still don't understand. But those are two exceptions uh, that, that uh, put the rule to the proof. proof. So your example of, of South Dakota makes me think of something that you said earlier in our conversation about continuity and consistency. Mm -hmm. yes. it, it sounds like they're an organization that have really nailed that continuity piece, you know, get, keeping the culture right, keep, um, finding people that believe the mission, that are happy to stick around. How can and, and can pass it on to a new generation of boards and a new generation of staff. 
uh, if the, that's probably the most important aspect. Is what it, we all make about the same returns over the decades. We just make them at different times. And so as a result, it, the, the key is not so much finding something that's successful. It's finding something you can stick with when it's not being successful, to be around when it becomes successful. Well, there's, an organiz- there's a group of us who have been getting together for 45 years now um, uh, that basically involve uh, all the uh, big state, the, the state investment funds in the U.S. Uh, and we have databases going back 40 years um, Oh, we have the ability to know who's done what over a long period of time. And at one point, we were, uh, we, the, the uh, five were picked out that were basically at the top five. And they all, we all did completely different things. Uh, at the time, one was a Washington State Investment Board, who is probably one of the biggest private equity investors in the world. One was obviously South Dakota. Uh, one was us, because at that point, uh, very simple style was working well over a 20, 30 year period. Um, I can't remember the other two. Uh, one at that time was Missouri, who was doing, uh, who had been doing very, very aggressive alternative investing, uh, hedge funds, things of that nature. Uh, but the key had been that at that time, those were funds that were able to keep that that approach over 20 to 25 to 30 years. Uh, that you didn't have the dynamic of someone coming in, a new board coming in saying this hasn't worked for three to five years, uh, fire those managers, change our style. Um, uh, that's more the rule in the industry, and that probably causes more problems and underperformance than anything else. Oh, I, th- I think that's... Uh... That's a very uh, accurate observation. Uh, those those changes, you know, having having worked with funds and seen those sorts of changes firsthand, they always end up costing a lot more than people think. Um, you know, sacking managers, hiring managers, it's um. It's there, very... there, there was a study done. Yeah, there was a study done. God, I can't remember the. Um... Um, what Madrilla was in, that basically had a deep database of managers that were fired by institutional funds and managers that were hired for the, the following three to five years. And the managers that were fired outperformed the managers that were fired over the next five years by percentage points. Um, it's it's uh, uh, it, 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 it's it's like it's like washing your car. As soon as you wash it, it's going to rain. As soon as you get a manager who's been doing well, it's, you're going to have to suffer through a period of underperformance. It's it's uh, I'm I'm enjoying all of these metaphors that keep coming up in our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning some new yeah. ones. I have to write these down. <laughs> Well, thank you very much well, for your for your time today, Bob. It's been uh, sure. a great pleasure talking to you. Always a pleasure. This is, this is one of the world's great uh, jobs. Uh, uh, you, you, you get to watch TV, read interesting things, uh, talk to people that, uh, from my standpoint, that are much brighter than me, that have to answer my dumb questions with a smile on their face. And as I've told my... Uh, board and I've told my legislature if I were independently wealthy I'd pay them to do this job Mm -hmm. well thank you very much for your time Bob thank you for listening to the i3 insights podcast for more information please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com thank you